Well, hello again. We have to stop meeting like this. People are getting suspicious. Well, I'm, I'm going to cover now a bit on the brain, and I think what's important to realize is that the uh, – they got the wrong lecture in here. Um, they have uh, the old lecture in here. Maybe we, somebody could uh, – can get somebody in to switch that up to the brain lecture. Thank you. See, the brains don't always work as well as we had hoped. Uh, uh, you have to look at the brain sort of like a muscle. You need to train it, you need to exercise, or you need to feed it properly for it to function. We used to think the brain was plastic like a, and hard, rather hardwired like a computer. And so in essence, it really is plastic like a muscle. The more you use the brain, the stronger it gets. And so we need to look at, that's it. It's got the word brain in it. That usually helps, okay. This is a typical first exercise we do with brain training. You have to get eye-brain coordination, brain-brain lecture. Okay, so we're going to talk about the brain now. So again, the, in essence, the brain is, is, is in essence more, uh, more plastic, like a muscle. And, you know, when people say, well, you know, nutrition isn't as important, well, you got to look at the brain sort of like your heart. If you get high cholesterol, you get your arteries clogged up, well, you get a heart attack. Same thing happens when the cerebral vasculature is not properly fed in the right fashion. You, too, will end up having, in essence, a brain attack or a stroke. So we need to train the brain like we do the body, and we need to have realistic expectations. And, you know, one of the most valuable things that we have is our memory. And this is the question and the fear of seniors more than anything else is losing the memory. It's their most valuable, absolutely their most valuable uh, asset is having memories of their family and their life and so on. And so when the brain starts to go, that's what the fear, great fear is with cognitive deficit, loss of memory, and of course Alzheimer's disease. Now, we need to look towards the future. You know, before Sir Roger Bannister from England, ran the sub-four-minute mile, it was considered physiologically impossible for a man to run a mile under four minutes. It could not be done. Well, the same year that he broke the sub-four-minute mile, a whole bunch of other athletes did the same year. Why? Because they broke that brain barrier function, that it cannot be done. And so we need to look in medicine in the same way of how can we break those paradigms of what we think is possible in the body and mind. And you really can't separate the body and mind. These are a few fellows, actually they're all friends of mine. This is Serge Nubray, he's 60 years old in that photograph. This is Bob Del Antique, he's 84 in this picture, he's about 80, he keeps lying about his age, I think he's 87, 88 now, but 84. This guy's only 35, so you gotta be old before you look good. That's the way it usually works. Arnold Schwarzenegger at the age of 12, you could see he had good, gemet good genetics. I know Arnold many years. I served on the President's Council of Physical Fitness and Sport. The reason I bring up Arnold, really fascinating, Arnold actually has a didactic memory, almost a photographic memory. He can come into a room, have not seen the people in this room for 20 years, and go around the room and say, hey, Joe, hey, Sally, hey, remarkable. When we had the meetings at the President's Council, he remembered everyone's name. He had terrific uh, memory recall. I remember once he received an award from a children's group, uh, it was a, uh, actually it was a Girl Scout group, and he almost had like tears in his eyes while he's looking at the award. He goes, you know, of all the awards I've gotten in my life, this one, this one is definitely the most recent. <laughs> so, uh, Charles Atlas, a nice example. You know, Charles Atlas, you, this, I don't know if you had this in the back of the comic books here, but guy goes to the beach, gets sand kicked in his face, and he goes back and he does a Charles Atlas course and goes back to the beach and beats the bad guy up and wins his girlfriend back. And we know when we went back to the beach, he beats us up worse for showing up twice. But Charles Atlas at this time in the 30s, you know, he, this was a time when people didn't even want to say they lifted weights or say that they did training. Uh, and so, and, and the reason I bring up training over and over again is because exercise is a critical component of brain health. And at the time, he was considered the world's most fit man, where today he wouldn't even win a female bodybuilding contest. So shows you how far we've come. So we're really like in an ageless society. Now, it's not great having a terrific body or looking great, you know, now, you know, <laughs> Over 60, 84, she, Kelly Nelson, 74 years old in this photo, 76 rather, in that photograph. 
Remarkable example. Now, to have a great body and have a long lifespan without good brain function, well, that's not really where we want to be. So these extensive lifespans without good health are not really the end goal. The end goal is to have great brain function and terrific body function. Now, I live in uh, Florida and New York and Chicago. And in Chicago, University of Chicago, we've been trying some new animal experimentation where we're substituting lawyers for the rats for our animal experimentation. And we do that because the brain size is identical. So <laughs> protocols, they reproduce as quickly as the rats, even faster. And most importantly, we can get a lawyer to do things we can never get a rat to do. So we're quite pleased. So now we genetically mixed a rat, experimental rat, with an industrialist financier. And we came up with a very interesting uh, item here. So. So looking at these examples, you know, Dick Clark, um, again, 30, 40 years apart, great brain function. He still uh, remembers all the hits going back in terms of the things he announces. Uh, Diane von Forstenberg, who is 30 years apart, is still dressing kind of odd. Uh, but we have to look at physical activity and training the brain in the same way we would train the body. So we need to adjust not only what medications can we use, but more importantly, how can we keep the blood circulation, the nutritional supply, <clears throat> the oxygenation, because as we know, anoxia is a, a critical portion. We've also found that trauma in patients over time could contribute to the beta amyloid plaques and some of the cognitive deficits that occur over time. We see it in boxers where the boxers get kind of punchy, you know, where they're not able to speak in the same fashion. But you also find that the secondary, secondary to the trauma, the athletes do have a more, or people do have a more propensity towards developing cognitive deficit. And I think we're going to find that there is some association between post-traumatic injury of the brain, as well as poor nutrition and poor oxygenation and anoxia. And Dr. Gordon had spoken earlier on the use of growth hormone in uh, patients with cognitive deficit, and that does seem to be a very, very interesting area of research as well, and we think that's something that should be explored extensively. Um, now, this is a very careful balancing act. Now, how do we balance the exercise training program, the proper nutrition program, the pharmaceutical interventions, and the natural interventions for enhancing brain function? And a lot of it comes down to balance. We need to balance our lifestyles and realize that s simple things like stress can also contribute to loss of brain function and cognition. When people are under stress, they don't sleep. Their food dietary habits are bad, their whole circadian rhythm is, is thrown off, and they begin to lose some of their function as well. So there's these simple balance items that are very, very helpful in allowing us to maintain proper brain function. I mentioned before about trauma. This is something that we're seeing more and more, realizing even like in boxing when somebody is their head is struck by the fist, the brain will bounce back and forth with, within the brain case. And many times, that's how you end up knocking the athlete out because of the trauma that occurs post-impact uh, during that. As well as in football, we see concussions and brain injury quite common in football because of the tremendous force now realizing that the athletes in American football are no longer 150, 200, 250 pounds. Now they're 300 plus and running as fast as an athlete who was running uh, at half their body weight in the past. So these are some of the basics in terms of the gross view, but now I'm going to go, uh, now I'm going to go through a bit of some of the uh, aspects of brain where we go through some more details. And let me just get to that point. Okay. Now, in reference to the brain, you want to look at some core principles. And in anti-aging medicine, we look at head first, and we interpret a lot of the medical conditions with respect to the brain and the spinal cord. So we want to have, just like we have a model for menopause and for males having andropause, we need to have something where there will be a section where we look at the brain as going through some degree of cerebropause.